Bueno, pues buenos días a todos. Muchas gracias por estar aquí en esta quinta sesión del curso sobre nanotecnología para la administración de fármacos herbales. Muchísimas gracias a los que asisten en persona, pero por supuesto especial agradecimiento con el profesor Jasmine Batak por este excelente curso que nos está ofreciendo. Thank you very much, Professor Jasmine. You are very welcome to continue with our very nice course, with the uh, fifth uh, le uh, lecture. Uh, this way, the audience yours. Gracias. Okay. okay. Gracias. You are taking my phone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just need to know the time. Thank you very much. Gracias. So, buenos días, everyone, and good morning. Uh, I'm Yashwan Tapatak, and I'll talk about that, but I'm bringing the greetings from the beautiful Tampa, Florida. And on this side, you will have our University of South Florida mascot, which is a bull. And always people will say, go bull in our university. Uh, this is the main entrance of university. Uh, it's a very beautiful campus, lushy green and very nice campus we have. And it is worth visiting campus. This is the picture of the downtown in the evening. Uh, very nice beautiful downtown here and this is the world famous Clearwater Beach which is one of the top 10 beaches in the world beautiful fine sand very nice sand and very uh, popular beach especially for the spring break uh, in uh, Tampa 13 million people come every year as tourists 13 million uh, people who come at uh, Tampa every year for tourists because of this and this is part of our university thing. This is our new building which is built in the downtown. Very beautiful and very student friendly building. So they have more space for students than the faculty. <laughs> they have a lot of beautiful arrangements, nice uh, cafeterias and big auditoriums. So 400 students can sit in one auditorium. Very beautiful. It's a very nice building downtown. And you can see the water from the downtown buildings from the windows. This is another picture of the downtown. And this is the, we are known for Tampa Bay. The Tampa Bay is 10 miles wide. And there are several bridges on the Tampa Bay. And it takes, uh, it's very beautiful. And there are board signs saying that there is no petrol gas station available for 10 miles <laughs> because there is no, it is all water. So this is one of the bridge on Tampa Bay, it's very beautiful bridge. This is part of our USF and then USF has two campuses, one is south and one is north in Tampa. And this is part of the south campus, very adjacent to the Tampa General Hospital, which is the best hospital in Florida. Very beautiful and very efficient hospital. And we have a, a very famous, it is top 10 transplant institute. So they transplant heart, liver, lungs, gallbladder, everything they do, operations. Very nice uh, place to be there. Then this is called a, uh, you know, pirate ship. So every year we have a pirate's uh, yeah. functioning, big thing. And at least, uh, half a million people will be participating in that huge place and very big parade. They call it Pirates Parade. And this is another uh, beautiful view of the Tampa um, Clearwater Beach. So, Buenas, buenas Dias. Buenas Dias. Uh, amo Colombia y la gente de aquí. Mi nombre es Yeshwan Patak. Actualmente estoy 
in USA. So, Professor E. Decano Asociado e la, in la Universidad del Sur de Florida, Panella College of Pharmacy. Estoy en Colombia como Becario Fulbright Specialist. Sincere thank to Universidad Distrital Francisco Jose de Caldas for hosting me as a Fulbright Specialist here at Bogota. My sincere thanks to Rector and Dean and other administrative heads supporting my trip here. My sincere thanks to Fulbright Specialist Commission of Colombia for supporting my trip to Bogota, Colombia. And I will fail to do if I do not mention my sincere gratitude to Professor Cesar Oro, Ore Leo Herano Figuero being my host and incredible support for making my stay happy here. And special thank to Reem Abdilohum and Shannon Fleming. They were very helpful in getting me here from World Learning. Sergio Villamil Sanchez and Sebastian Villamitar and many other from Colombian Fulbright Commission for their kind support. Professor Luis H. Reyes and Juan C. Cruz, Willy Moreno, Luis Fernando, they were all encouraging me to come here because a lot of people were telling that Colombia is not safe. Mm -hmm. And they were saying, no, you come here. It is a very safe place to come and you don't worry about it. And I realized that because yesterday I was talking in the hotel with the people. And they said that Colombia, you think that it is only for drugs and bad things, but it is not true. And that's why yes, I showed you the picture of my food, dinner. They made it very beautiful. They said, we are good in many things. That's why they were proud to say that. And I am very happy about that. And then special thank to Professor Alexis, who is uh, from International Office, UDFJDC, and Alvaro Vasquez, who encouraged me to come here. And their encouragement is to outcome is I am here. Desde el fondo de, de mi corazón. If you understand my Spanish, then you'll surely understand my English. So, today we are going to talk about a very interesting topic. Because what is happening is, in the last 10 years, the things are changing in the healthcare. And good number of changes are happening because of the people like you in physics. They are coming up with new and newer gadgets. They are coming up with new and newer devices which are very useful to maintain a good health. And that is why the technology is changing the face of pharmacy profession as well as healthcare. And it is very interesting to see how the things are changing. So on August 14, 2010, there was a headline on the front page of New York Times which read, pharmacies do more than count pills. And they think that if you go to pharmacy, they will count 1 to 30 and that's all. They give you the medicine, you go home. But they do much more than that. And nowadays it is becoming more and more interesting that as the older population is growing, people are needing advices. They take 10 medicines. So they have to know whether they are, there is a drug-drug interaction or there is a problem or drug nutraceutical interaction or what kind of food they should eat, what kind of exercise schedule they have. So they have so many questions and the first person whom you can walk in and talk to in healthcare is pharmacist because it is readily available, the pharmacies are right, right on the corner of the road and people can walk in. It is not like if I want to take an appointment with my family medicine doctor, he will give me appointment after two months by the time I am relieved from my disease. So it is very difficult to get the appointment with the physician. But it is very easy to talk to pharmacists because it is readily available. And that is why people are saying that pharmacist is becoming more and more important person in the healthcare team efforts. And that is where this is uh, going to be the, the story was that Eloise Jelinas depends on a personal health coach who is pharmacist. At Barney's Pharmacy, her local drugstore in Augusta, Georgia, the pharmacist um, outlines all her medication, teaching her what times of the day to take the drug and what will help control her diabetes. So this is how the pharmacists are changing their roles. But now we have to understand that by analyzing and tying together massive amounts of information, we can change the way we conduct business. 
you know, and manage healthcare work in the world of agriculture to manage energy consumption. So what is happening is since 1970s, people are accumulating data, computers. Now you have data of millions of patients. Suppose you want to get a data, now NIH have databases, we'll see that. So you can have access to databases which accumulates a lot of information. Information about the diseases, the drug, side effects and all the things. But there was not much information how to retrieve the data, how to analyze the data, how to use the data and how to infer based on the data. And that is where the new technology started coming into the picture. So initially computer accumulated data but no technology to analyze the data. But now in last 20 years it is enormous mm -hmm. and the area is called bioinformatics. You must mm -hmm. have heard about it. And now the world is moving towards artificial intelligence. So you will find this data which has been accumulated will be changing. You will get a lot of information through this and that is what is happening. It is very interesting to know that 65% of the North American mothers use five or more forms of technology. So they use iPhone, they use iPad, they use I, you know, all sorts of technology they use. So the patient is highly educated now. It is not that patient it doesn't know anything. So in December 2015, 2012, they said that when the doctor is not needed, that was a headline in the newspaper in New York Times. And it goes at describe potential of pharmacists and other health professionals to fill the big gap in primary care. And it talks about how pharmacists are underutilized given their education, training and clothing. Now, the world realized the role of pharmacists and nurses in COVID because doctors were not available. You cannot go to the hospital. Where you will go? And that was that's where the pharmacies were open. Lot of shops were closed, but the pharmacies were open. The malls were closed. Pharmacies were open. And that's where in COVID, a lot of people went to the pharmacist and learned a lot from them and they were trained. We had several programs in our college for COVID training to the pharmacy people. And that was like a, a learning process for them. So it is the, the move, things are moving in a very right direction for the adoption of technology. Now you will find how the statistics have changed. So it took two years for Apple to sell two million iPhones. Two years for iPhone, first iPhone. Then it took two months to sell more than two million iPads. And then they took one month to sell, sell one million iPhone 4. It took one day to sell one million iPhone. So, it is estimated that Apple sold 5 million iPhone in the first four days of release. Can you believe that how people were hooked to the iPhones? Everybody has phone now in there and they are very smart phones. You know, I come here and Professor Caesar put the password and I don't have to do it again because my smartphone takes it up and I walk in the university. As soon as I enter in, I get connected with the internet. I go to hotel, I get connected with hotel internet. So this is becoming a very good tool for changing the face of healthcare. And this is what we would like to understand about this. So there was a public radio, a national Ibarka NPR, where they said why the hospitals want pharmacies to be our coach. And it talked about how hospitals are partnering with community pharmacists and to help patients out of the hospital to get out of the hospital. Now what is happening is we have a clinical pharmacy program which is called Doctor of Pharmacy and those people are working, they have specialized training. So they do four years of, they do undergrad, three to four years of undergrad, then they do four years of PharmD, Doctor of Pharmacy, then they do two years of residency and then they do three years of fellowship for pharmacy. So we have specialized pharmacy who are very trained in a certain area. Like in our my college, we have a specialized training for oncology pharmacist. So the cancer patient get many different types of medicines. And there are a lot of interactions. They have to define the dose for the patient based on their height, weight and all those things because it is the right thing. So our students are trained for almost seven, eight years 
work in pharmacy. So they in and during our PharmD program for two and a half years they will study in the classroom and one and a half year they will work in the hospitals in clinical pharmacy. So they have a hands-on experience to deal with the patient and now they are becoming advisors and they are becoming part of the healthcare team with the physician and believe it or not in America more than 300,000 people die in the hospitals because of drug drug interactions because of drug neutrophilic 300,000 people die and that's why they are now realizing that this can be prevented if you take the advice of pharmacist and that's why whenever the physician write the prescription now it goes to the pharmacist and pharmacist looks at the prescription and if he finds that there is a if he or she then there is a discrepancy there is a problem there is a drug drug interaction he will immediately call back to the doctor and say that this is not a good idea to give these two drugs together now the doctor says that okay i am taking the responsibility so then they will, it will be his responsibility but otherwise they can point out such drug drug reaction and save the life of patient this is where and now with the genomics we'll talk about that later uh, it is becoming very important uh, for the patients how the they can change the life for the patient. I think there is a some yeah. issue. Can check. Sorry. No problem. Oh, so, there are people in Admitter. But no, but the problem is that there is a some issue. Okay. Yeah, sure. Good. So we have a good number of people there online. Sorry for the interruption. No, 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 no problem. It is important. And they can write their questions anytime. And I will answer yeah, yeah. them in between also. But there is a sound, sound issue. Children is happening. Eh, ¿Están escuchando bien? ¿Hay alguien que nos conteste por el chat? Sí, ok. So, go ahead. So, okay. So there is another interesting thing happening is that almost 80% of the consumers are interested in mobile health solution now. They don't want to go to physician, they don't want to go to, but they want the solution in mobile health at home. And medical and healthcare apps are third fast growing category for iPhone and Android phones. So the apps, different types of apps are so there is a more than 17,000 healthcare apps available now and you can see it and most of the physics people, software engineers, all the engineering people are contributing towards the healthcare. Earlier there was no such possibility but now there is an interprofessional interdisciplinary research work because of the technology. Because of nanotechnology, the size of the iPhone became smaller and smaller and lot of electrical engineers some of the few great scientists in pharmacy are electrical engineers. I worked with Professor Willie Moreno, who is an electrical engineer professor, and we have a collaboration. So we developed some devices, we had patents in that, and I normally become the chair of their graduate program for the um, their PhD thesis, because I understand what they are doing. Because they are, we had, Dr. Moreno had a graduate student who did his PhD on networking within the hospital and how to reduce the challenges of communications within the hospital. That was an electrical engineering project and he is now vice president of one of the hospitals. Because he, but he is not a pharmacist. But the project was solely based on electrical, artificial neural network and connections and all those things and putting it together. Very interesting area. 
for physics also you can move into the healthcare which is a very because there are a lot of interdisciplinary possibilities are there and that is why the solutions are very important now there are thousands of healthcare apps are available and 60% of these apps are directly aimed toward customer consumer and that's very interesting thing happening so what we would like to see is that some of the future headlines can be pharmacies clinical services become a standard in healthcare that's what we want to see our retirees demand medication therapy management md mtm by pharmacist uh, or pharmacists play major role in designing drug treatment regimen for genomics or even the possible negative headline can be that importation and automation lead to demise of the pharmacy profession and i will talk about this at the end it's not in the slide but i tell you what how the things are changing and big problems are coming up for the pharmacy profession so rapid technological development and relentless innovation are the two key uh, key trend that will provide a forthcoming massive transformation of healthcare and that is going to happen in coming 5 to 10 years we will find a big transformation in healthcare so vision for future pharmacy practice is pharmacist will be the healthcare professional responsible for providing patient care that ensures optimal medication therapy outcomes and pharmacist will have the authority to manage medication therapy and will be accountable for patient therapeutic outcome so this was uh, what was predicted and the future of pharmacy is here that is what we say for our college so you will find that changing face of pharmacy profession is noted by dennis helling in 2013 when he received a remington honor he said if you do not like change you will like irrelevance even less if you are not ready for the changes then you will be irrelevant and then you will not like it so every student whether whether he is an undergraduate student or a graduate student or a faculty professor or a senior professor all of them have to be ready for the changes if you are not ready to change you are going to be irrelevant within no time and that is what is happening now that everybody has to get ready for change now if i say that i have a car with petrol gas and if i am not ready for electric car i will be outdated a day will come that there will be electric cars a day will come you will get your amazon package by drones to your home which is happening now a day will come that we will have sky highways so you take off your car go up and then go come to your university it's going to happen in another 10 15 years you will be driving the cars in the air like you know it's a now drones are going there in place of drones you get the cars and then you do that now if i say no no, no i am going to drive on the road only then you will be outdated because so you need to be ready you need to be ready for the change if you are not ready for the change then you are going to be irrelevant obsolete and nobody will like you and this is what we have to understand changing face of not only healthcare but it is everywhere in physics chemistry everywhere now in chemistry when i was a student of chemistry in my college we used to do lot of hands on things now half of the chemistry you do it on computer because there are programs mm-hmm. called qualitative structure activity relationship qsar then there is a autocad mm-hmm. programs are there so half of the work you do on computer and 10% or 20% you do it in the lab so it may happen that in many years coming in time half of the buildings of the labs will be empty because you don't need them half of the work you can do it on computer so you have to understand that the world is changing fast and we are sitting here now a day will come i don't have to come to colombia we do the same thing i sit in the america and give the lectures it's possible now it's, it's very easy to do that in covid we have done it in covid i had given talks in many international conferences uh, from my home most of our audience is online yeah that's now. what you know majority audience is online i don't see their faces also so it is a changing face and then you'll find that i have a picture here so we 
for last 100 years we were working with tablets and capsules everything now we are coming with mrna viruses mrna vaccines and all the thing now the next stage is we will be working with the genes dna rna sirna mrna so the things are changing so a day may come that you will have more RNA based medicines than tablets and capsules and which is going to happen because you are taking a lot of biotechnological products which are not given in the form of tablet or capsule but they go injection and that is what the changes are happening now the pharmacist has to learn all these things if they say that I can't and the challenge we have to understand look and especially for the young people in my audience please understand that I am a good role model for you because I started my education in 1971 and I am still active and I will be active at least for coming 10 years at least <laughs> so and I am very productive I have 350 publications 70 books I just signed the contract for a new book with two Colombian professors and so you are now completing your undergrad suppose in 2023 you make sure that you are going to be active till 2083 now if you tell me that I learned undergrad in 2023 and I will stick to my knowledge of undergrad will you be able to work in 2083 possible correct so you have to get ready for the changes in 50 years you all will have grey hair, maybe look different, but you will be active. You will be very productive professional. And that is where you have to understand that the science, world of science is nothing but lifelong learning. And lifelong accepting the changes. You cannot say that I am not going to change. Once you say that, you are done. And that is very important. We have to learn the changing scenario and in good old days they used to say that generation is like 30 years then it became less and less and less now the generation is counted in months because you get new sec first generation antibodies second generation antibodies third generation antibodies first generation iPhone second generation iPhone and Apple is coming up with i4 1 4 pi 12 now it is i4 14 correct and it's different it's much better than iphone 4 and that is what is happening so generation is becoming smaller and smaller not 30 years but in computers it is less than a year because computers also change the size of the computer change size of the tv changes size of the electronic gadgets everything is changing and this is where the concept of generation is also changing. So the landscape of healthcare industry will undergo historic transformation. One is increased demand in healthcare staffing. In America, in our university, we recently got $35 million grant to increase the number of nurses, students, mm -hmm. because there is a shortage of nurses. And that is what is happening. So the government has to put money to get adequate number of nurses because you have now older population which needs attention and that is where the healthcare is the area it will never die because every person who is born <laughs> will have some diseases will have some problems and that's why healthcare is one of the lifelong life living long living profession where there are less challenges then industry preparation is for the accountability. Nowadays in America they are saying that if a patient is admitted to the hospital and if the patient is released from the hospital, if he comes back again, then the doctor is accountable for his mistakes. Because why patient came back? And in there is a there are now accountability parameters. So they are the physicians are now accountable for the treatment. Because the healthcare cost goes up. If you go to the hospital today, get out of the hospital in one week then again go back to the hospital in another one week every time the cost increases for healthcare and that's why 
there is the accountability which is important for pharmacists, nurses, doctors, everybody, so that patient will be treated properly. Then there is the digital age meets the masses. Now everybody carries the iPhone, so digital everything now, you must have heard about it that uh, in India, India came up with a very beautiful program for UPA. And now you go, you don't carry anything. You just pay everything on your cell phone. Your even if you buy vegetable, the vegetable vendor will have. You can buy. It. You can use their kit. I was so impressed because yesterday, it is Sunday. I was traveling, so we went to one of the mall with our friend, and in the mall, uh, I was thinking that now they will give you pay the money and you'll get it. He got one piece of paper with a scanner. And then the scan went into the machine and the car went out of the parking lot. It is much advanced than you are Colombia advanced than America. In America, we put the card and then we pay the money, we get the receipt there. Here you don't do all the things, you get a scanner. <laughs> and you show the scanner and that's all. So it is improved version than America. I really enjoyed that. I said, Professor Luis, that, wow, you are ahead of us. And it is very interesting to see. Now a day will come, we are now coming up with machinery where you put your thumb print and you get your prescription. It's happening now. So do you need a pharmacist? Now this is the challenge which is going to happen. And then more opportunities for specialty training and focus on consumer awareness and preventive care. Preventive care is becoming a big, big thing now. Everybody is like to make sure that they don't get the diseases as, or they get the diseases as late as possible. So there are lots of genes, lots of activities, lots of exercise modules are there. Even in our university, we have several gyms. Our university is very large. So we have 85,000 people on the campus. And for 85,000 people, there are several gyms. So in our medical college, we have a big gym very beautiful gym is there and you will find that the gym is always full. So you have to book the machines and all those things. So it is and like that there are several gyms on the campus for students. We have several bicycle things for the students. There are automatic bicycles on the, because they are providing all the facilities so that they will exercise. And this is where it is happening and they charge also. So they get the money out of that. So this is where the awareness and preventive care is becoming the mainstream thinking about it. So you will find that technology is changing, the physician practice, it is changing, the caregiver's assistance, patients learn and do, and institution management is changing very fast because of the technology. So you will find that in good old days, people used to carry this big book. They used to call it Physician's Desk Reference. And it was this book, big. It was a red colored big book. Nowadays I don't see it anywhere. It used to be, when I was a student, that was the only book I had. We have to learn about that. And now, the physicians don't use that. Physicians use their iPhone, because iPhone can carry the whole 10 physician desk references. 10 books can be available. So iPhone became a big thing, which is changing, and mobile health, uh, app, self-care, health, uh, remote monitoring, all these new apps, applications are becoming very popular and the mobile technologies. So the doctors do not carry anything. They go with a stethoscope just because they want to have it. <laughs> That's doctor symbol. They don't need it actually. And they carry one iPhone. That's all. With their lab coat, they walk around with iPhone and most of the work can be easily done through the uh, mobile uh, technology. So you have a digital health now. What you do is if you go to the hospital, you can see your heart. Uh, if they do their, uh, uh, guys, uh, this, uh, they do different types of study on the heart. And in such scenario, they put a robot. And the robot will move through your heart. And they will find out whether there is a uh, clot or not, or where is the blockage or not. And that technology is now so advanced that you are not even anesthetized. The robot is so small, it's a nano robot, it goes through. You are not anesthetized, they don't do anything, they give you an iPad and you can see your heart pumping and the robo moving through your veins and arteries. You can see it, you are alive, you see the things happening. And it is very interesting to see how this angioscopy 
uh, is done and it is very fascinating to see that and you know the tablets are used in hospitals to explain so now you can create three dimensional heart on the tablet and then you can have three dimensional heart you can explain that how it is happening where is your heart working and you can see it. anything which is inside the body can be shown with your uh, marker you know the robots which are going with a light and they can show it it's very interesting to see the thing then this is another thing fitbit tracker and many types of things that are available how many steps you walk and now people recently there was a paper published saying that if you walk minimum 10000 steps every day you will have your alzheimer's will be delayed you walk walk and walk the more you walk and especially in your case it is a great thing because you walk up and down yeah, yeah. you know so if you want to go to the rector's office you are climbing 10 floors i did that once i don't think i have to do again <laughs> but that is a great exercise here in the university atmosphere here it is good for your health now there are several thing what is happen see that there is a app which is called skin app now if you have something on your skin especially for children then the mothers are worried about you and take the doc- patient to the doctor child you don't have to do it now if you if you add up download the app it will take the picture of the skin rash it will analyze and then it will tell you whether you should go to the doctor or you should not go to the doctor and this type of apps are now available for many different diseases so you don't have to rush to the doctor just because there is a rash so naturally people are learning a lot of things are mobile so you you can make your decisions for many of these healthcare challenges now another thing is called eye triage application now eye triage application is very interesting on your iphone you can connect yourself to the physician you can connect yourself to the cloud cloud storage mm-hmm. and your data like my data i can access it from my iphone here in colombia because it is in cloud all cloud you can access from anywhere on earth so it is very easy for suppose tomorrow i meet with an accident here what i will have to do is to give you the password or i can call my physician and he will connect with the physician here and the physician in colombia will have all the data so they don't have to repeat lot of things there if they can make their decisions very quickly and this is global data available and you can connect now there is another application here if that suppose i am diabetic then i can connect with the nih database for diabetes and learn from there and this is where this itrh programs are becoming very uh, common then there is a headset of electroencephalograph eeg you if you are suffering feeling you have a stroke get the eeg and you will be able to know whether you should rush to the hospital or you have time eeg ecg all are now can be done with the through app through your iphone and that is becoming a very popular thing you have uh, apple watches are there so in the apple watch you can see lot of your blood pressure diabetes you see your heart beats you know in uh, covid you must have seen there was a heart beat machine which was popular everywhere and then oxygen machine was there so it will tell you oxygen content in your blood because if the oxygen content goes down then you will suffer from lung injuries and people die in covid so that's why these small small equipments were so helpful in covid and that's why these are most health oriented smart watches are coming up so you just apple watch you just put it and then you get lot of information how many steps you walk what is your di- sugar what is your blood pressure what is your heart rate and everything is available so you can make a decision the patient can make a decision whether he is ready to go to hospital or he can stay at home and that's why these are very important things changing our uh, scenario so there are recently introduced gadgets for healthcare monitoring is wireless smart glucose monitoring system so you don't have to do anything you know your iphone will have an attachment you do the glucose it will be sent to the doctor directly from your iphone to his iphone and the doctor will say oh you reduce your dose now because your sugar is normal or you increase your dose because your sugar is and he will text you he will text to the pharmacist so you are 
medications will be changed and this all thing will be happening in less than a minute so you are now accessible to the healthcare if you want to take appointment of the doctor two months but through technology immediately less than a minute and you go walk to the pharmacy and get your medication change medication so that is there so there is a, a calibri toothbrush is there telespec food analyzer is there kinsa smart thermometer are there so there are so many the bedded sleep and wellness device tracks your breathing heart rate movement uh, snoring environment and sleep patterns while you are sleeping it is just part of your equipment which remain there and then you start doing it then there is a cardio mobile ekg you know you you have it on your uh, i think you can get your ekg so that you will know exactly whether your breathing was fast less whether your heart beats are normal or abnormal then wireless blood pressure monitor is there pain relief device is there so these are very few but there are many of them uh, which are going on there is another very interesting thing which is now happening is that younger people go to the cities like your family might be in the villages now in villages there is if you create this quiet care remote monitoring system what you have to do is to have some video camera in the house in villages you can monitor i i have a zoom monitor in on my computer i have my iphone if i get connected to the internet i can see who is at the door in my home in tampa in colombia i can easily talk to that person also that hey i am not at home don't knock the door go <laughs> So I can talk that. I can see what is happening in my home. So same thing you can do for your parent. They are in villages. You can monitor with few video cameras, and it costs like thirty nine forty dollars to put this can video camera. And now you are very convinced that your parents are safe. If suppose your father fell down, immediately you can call your neighbor and say, "Hey, something is wrong in my home. Go to my home, open the key, and and." i can open my garage door if i am connected to the internet from here so interesting so it is now the this all these gadgets are changing so if you are quiet care remote monitoring systems the physician can look at the patient old patient if they are staying alone they can look at it because they will have access to their you know close care monitoring and that is where uh, this is big because this is important nowadays children the, the, the people have only one or two children and the old people when they go to the city parents stay in villages and that's where the challenges come and this is a quiet care remote monitoring system it is used by the data now this is very important thing which is big and open data in good old days every patient will have file and the physician will walk in the big thing and pick up the file everything was manual they have to write the prescription put it there so they will write twice the prescription one for patient one for file and these files were there now no hospital has such thing everything is now digitalized all the filing and everything is digitalized and again most of these is in the cloud so accessibility is very high you can access from anywhere in the world uh, you have many different types of program there for the accessibility and then what is happening is you have big data open data so your mobile device can be connected with all different major big data so nih has a huge data nsf has a big data most of the universities who do like john hopkins john hopkins has a major database where you can access to certain immunogenic immunotherapy database is there so they have hundreds and thousands of papers on that database immunotherapy for cancer treatment so even if you are treating a patient in colombia you have access to that database so you can study and see whether my treatment plan is correct or not whether it is in tune with the john hopkins research work or not and all these information is readily available but you have to do that you have to make so you, have, you the physicians have a responsibility to go get the data 
access the database, get the information and make sure that the treatment plan is good for the patients. And this is where the accessibility is very important because remotely also the physicians can and you will find uh, in Colombia also it must be common but in India now even the smaller towns do the transplant, heart transplant because they have you have several YouTube videos to show how to do the transplant. So the surgeons are already trained but the new technologies can be taught. Mm -hmm. So if you come to our university USF, we have a center for simulation and we do a lot of robotic surgery. So people from Colombia, suppose the surgeons here, if they want to learn something new, how it is happening, they can either connect with our USF and then they pay the fees for that and then they can see how the surgeries are happening in day to day from sitting in Colombia and then they have access to learning, they can ask the questions and this is how the simulation training is going on in many big universities and nowadays it is another thing which is happening is uh, the, like Moffat Cancer Research Center, they have a setup. So you pay, the price is high, my, from my point of view I think it is very high, but you pay $2000 to the doctor from Moffitt Cancer Research Center and he will look at all your files. He will tell the, the so you are in India, pay $2,000 to this doctor, he will look at all your files and give you the expert advice. And this type of telemedicine advice is becoming very popular. Uh, as on today, it is for rich people. But a day will come that there will be competition if one doctor is charging $2,000, another doctor will start charging $1,800, third doctor will charge $1,000 and then when the competition comes up, the price will go down and that is where the telemedicine is becoming a very popular. People take second opinion from experts from different universities and different big hospitals in America. It is becoming a very common thing happening there. And then there is the easy personal health data download. So you can download your personal health or information from the cloud, from the databases and that becomes very easy for the people, especially for senior citizens, this is becoming a very uh, useful thing uh, for them. Then medical and research databases, as I mentioned, there are several, several universities put up a lot of databases and many of them are free. Many of them charge little bit, like uh, in our university now, we are thinking there is a big thought process going on. There is a tug of war going on between some people are saying that the bibliotech library should be closed because library is big building. But if you go and see the library, there are not even 10 students. So that big building, whether it is properly utilized or not. So there is the argument going on that if your all books are on, available on databases, all research papers are available on databases, do we need a library? And if we do not need the library, can we use it for some other purpose? And this is where they are thinking about dismantling libraries in the universities so that, but there are some people who really want to read. And that is why that the argument is going on. Senior people like me, I always argue for having the library. Yeah. But the younger people say, no, we don't need it. We read it on my, our computer. But there is a challenge. And I think by next generation of professors, library will be gone because they are come I am not as compatible as my younger assistant professor who is more compatible <laughs> with computer thing. So that is database. Now there is another area which our physics students can work on this is a digital health game. There are a lot of health video games to explain the disease, to explain how to work it out and how to do all the exercises. Beautiful games are there which are available to download. So there are Humanize, the insurance company in America, which has developed many games for the healthcare. Then there is the interactive products. You must have seen, now you have seen it. Just I just told you, scanners. So all the products have scan bar, barcodes. So as soon as you pick up the barcode, suppose you uh, input your data into your iPhone, saying that my sugar is 150, my blood pressure is this, my heart rates are this. Once that data is available on your health pad, on your iPhone, 
you just have to scan the product and your iPhone will tell you don't buy it. It's not good for you. <laughs> so you are now you can utilize your mobile phone to understand what is good for you in the grocery store and what is bad for you in the world. So rather than reading, you know, what we do normally is we'll pick up the product, read the ingredient, mm. they are all small and then say, oh, this is not good for me, this is good for me and put it back. Now it is very simple, scan it and it will tell you, don't take it because it is not good for your diabetes, this is high sugar. <laughs> and it will give the explanation also why it is happening and this type of program interactive products as well as interactive information is happening and you get lot of information out of this and most of the I was so surprised you know I was coming here and I really appreciate how the Colombians are doing much better than that I was uh, standing at the airport in uh, Atlanta so one of the person um, from Colombia he was standing there, so we started talking. He was speaking good English, actually. So, uh, I was talking to him. I will show you. Rose and, yeah. So, this person was standing next to me in the airport. So, he's, uh, we were talking and he said, I told him that I am going to Colombia. He said, wow, good, you are going to Colombia. So he said, so I said, uh, he, he runs something, he is architect, Juan Evdo Rubio, Colombia. So he said, I am an architect, but I have a tourist company. So if you want to travel around in Colombia, I will be able to help you. So I said, okay, give me your number. He said, no number, you scan this. <laughs> I scanned it and it came on my WhatsApp. <laughs> I reckon. I have never seen that, you know, I was so impressed with Colombia, that person. I said, hey, you must teach me how to do that on my uh, cell phone, because otherwise I keep on typing numbers yeah, and all yeah. those things. I was impressed with Juan Evdo, Evdo Fudo. How will you spell his name? Juan Fernando Rubio. Oh, Juan Fernando Rubio. Mm -hmm. So, Evdo, that is short for. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was so impressed with his interactive scan barcodes, and he gave me the barcode for WhatsApp. Very interesting. Uh -huh. I have never done in my life. So these barcodes are very useful to us and they will help us to understand what we should take or what we should not take. Now this is another thing which is happening on a large scale called telehealth and telemedicine. And nowadays doctors are spending, you know, in COVID especially this became very useful. Until now people were reluctant. They wanted to know, meet the doctor, feel the patient, this, that. Nowadays in COVID, there was no option. All in our area in Florida, all the hospitals were closed. They were only for COVID patients. All beds were for COVID patients. It was like a pandemic. So, uh, there were no surgeries done for almost one and a half years. But the doctors were, have to be accept, accessible. So, what the hospital done was, they put several video uh, TV um, things everywhere, TV sets and then the doctors will sit in their office and like that they will communicate with each other with the patient so they will be talking to the patient for 15 minutes and this uh, patient will be convinced because if you see the doctor you feel good if you don't see the doctor if suppose you have only audio it doesn't work you see the doctor doctor is looking good and then it will be nice to have telecommunication so the patient will show this is what is happening this is this that is this and the doctor will say, don't worry, you know, I am writing the prescription. He will go to the pharmacist and get the prescription. And this telehealth and telemedicine became very popular in uh, COVID. And nowadays, they say that almost 35 to 40 percent of the patients are now opting for telemedicine. So, you have a, when you write for the appointment with the doctor, you have an option whether you want a telehealth telemedicine appointment or you want an in-person appointment. Telemedicine appointment is quickly available. In-person appointment after two months. So people prefer telemedicine appointment because you can talk to him for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you are done. And you don't have to go to the hospital. And then look at for the parking, you know, so many yeah. problems are there. This is the best way to do it and that is major change in the healthcare now. 
the patient don't want to go to the hospital doctor don't want to see the patient in person and now what is happening the problem was earlier that doctor has to put the stethoscope get your ecg everything in the hospital correct now you do at home you do exactly what is needed what stethoscope reads you do it through your iphone through all the application and the doctor gets all the information so as soon as you do everything the doctor will get all the information like if you have a telehealth appointment at 10 11 am by 10 45 you start doing all the testing on your iphone by 10 50 the doctor gets all the data he looks at the data at 11 o'clock he will tell you oh you are you look good no problem you don't need changes in medicine or he will say oh your ecg was not good i think you should change and the medicine can be changed so this is a great way and that is how the whole the, what i was telling that there will be a big transformation of healthcare which is happening and then now like my friend yesterday i went to tabio so his house is on the mountain there are no doctors around he sits there and he gets communication with the physician he doesn't have to come down from the mountain he is happy doctor is happy he doesn't have to climb <laughs> he is happy he doesn't have to climb. So this is the changes. This is a very serious and very interesting big change which is happening in the healthcare and we should be ready for that. Now another thing which is very important is that social media. You know, WhatsApp, websites, podcast, tweets, everything is now very helpful. For, and I'll give you a nice example for the social media. I ride my bike every day, 7 to 10 miles, me and my wife. So we ride and if we see Indian guy in America, we stop. We talk to the person. So like that we talk to one family. And then we became friends, they used to come to our place, we used to go to their place. And suddenly one day evening around 9.30, 10 o'clock, the guy came to my home and he knocked our door. He was very disturbed. So I, I was surprised because he did not call me, he came at 10 o'clock, so we were worried uh, and you know why we were worried because in last, this year till October, we have more than 580 mass shootings in America. Recently 18 people were killed that last. So we also are worried, like Colombia, we are worried, you know, when I was planning to come to Colombia, I was reading about Colombia and people there was one person who commented, Colombia, Bogota is safer than Indianapolis <laughs> in America. That was the comment. So I was happy about that. So the that person started, he was, I opened the door, he was crying, he was older than me. He was crying, so I was feeling very bad. So I brought him in, I said, what is happening? So he said that today the doctors found out that my, my wife has a cancer. And he doesn't know, he was very scared about it because he was not educated much. He was an engineer, then came to America, was teaching in the school. So he never studied about all these things. So he was worried about why, what will happen, cancer, she may die very soon. So then I said, let's go, come sit. I gave him some orange juice, took him to the computer and then I opened many websites. So one of the websites was, I conquered the cancer. And the lady was telling the whole story, how she found out she's cancer and then how she fought, how she taught chemotherapy, how she got operated and now she's surviving after 10 years still alive. And like that, there are so many websites which talk about cancer in social media. Then he accepted everything and he was consoled that his wife is not dying tomorrow. You know, so this is how social media really helps a lot. You can get a lot of information on social media about whatever you ask. You know, I normally uh, ask, where is Munsare? I will get immediately 10 people saying, go this way, that way, that way, that way. It is social media, helping each other. And it's a great uh, change in uh, healthcare. It is helping a lot of people. And doctors always, you know, I don't know you call it or not, but we call this as called WhatsApp University. Do you call it that in here, WhatsApp University? So a lot of good things and bad things both come on WhatsApp. So you have to be selective on your WhatsApp University. Yeah. So that's what the social media is very helpful in healthcare 
uh, there are community websites for health information. I had a cancer and then he will talk about the story. Then there are several uh, social media uh, websites are there and it is very interesting to see how it can be helpful to the people. Then there are epilepsy meets group, not only in America, but all over the world. There are groups, they meet online and they share with their information and they say, oh, this is what I had happened. So the other person say, oh, yeah, it happened to me too, but this is how I managed it. Now they're learning from each other. So the support groups, social media support groups and meeting groups are very popular. Many of the cities in America, we have in Florida, there are several diabetic groups. They meet every month and they exchange their thought process, exchange their thing, a lot of information is, and there are many groups like that. So it's a very good uh, group there. So this is all changing the healthcare. This is all changing the healthcare scenario. Now another thing which is really changing the healthcare is geriatric pharmacotherapy. I am always talking to you and you might have been bored now. But the population of older people is growing and it is going to affect the healthcare around the world whether you want it or not. And that's why the older population, person 65 years and older, are number 39.6 million in 2009 in America. They represented 12.9% of the US population. By 2030, the population of older people will be 72.1 million in America. That will be a big number. Out of 350, 72 million are old, you can imagine what a pressure on healthcare. And people 65% represented 12.4%, it will be 19%. And once it is 19%, almost major chunk of healthcare will be eaten by them. And this is where geriatric uh, pharmacy, uh, pharmacotherapy has become a big challenge for the pharmacy and it is going to change because a lot of pharmacists, nurses, doctors, you know, nowadays, they never had palliative care residency till now. Recently, they have started residency in palliative care. So people, once they, they become old, they go to nursing homes, they become old, they go to hospice, and from hospice, they go to palliative care. Palliative care, you still survive because your brain is working, your eyes are working, your heart is working, but the body is not working. And in such scenario, you cannot kill them. And those are, uh, at that time, you just have to maintain their, and that is called palliative care, just to maintain the human being till the death comes. And this is palliative care is becoming now a full-fledged residency program where they are training the doctors how to deal with this type of scenario. So you can imagine such type of new and newer residencies will have to be introduced in coming 5, 10, 15 years. So because of the uh, geriatric population which is happening. Another thing which is growing and it is going to be a big thing is bioinformatics, the unavoidable alternative for enormous data and application. So bioinformatic tools and services have important roles to play and all aspects of drug discovery to development to delivery, designing of the drug, predicting the drug metabolism, toxicity, model drug gene and drug protein interaction. So what is there happening is earlier we used to do all these studies in animals, then do the clinical studies in the patient and then do the clinical studies in the healthy patient. Now lot of this information can be done on computer. So you don't have to go to the lab because you will be able to know if the structure is changed, your computer will be able to tell you whether it is toxic or non-toxic, whether it will be useful or not useful, what disease condition it will be useful, not useful because of the informatics and this is where the world is changing, the pharmacy profession changing. In the post-genomic area, gathering biological information is no longer a bottleneck for the scientific. You get a lot of information, there is no bottleneck now to get the information. And the major hurdle remains in the efficient organization, analysis and interpretation of the data. How to organize, how to analyze and how to interpret the data. And establishment of maintenance and open access for large data sets has been important in driving the field forward. So there are a lot of databases available. You can pick up what you want and then you can analyze, interpret and use for your purposes. And that's how the whole drug designing, drug development is changing. So you don't do a lot of experiment now. You sit on the computer and see you can make 3000 different structures. 
those 3000 different structures based on again bioinformatics you can identify that only 10 structures are useful for a particular disease now you don't have to evaluate 33000 structures but now you are coming down focusing down to only 10 structures then out of 10 structures you will find only two structures are related with therapeutic efficacy then now you are saving the lives of so many people animals because you are not experimenting with 3000 structures but only with two structures. and this is where the bioinformatics is going to be very very useful and it's a big tool now that most of the universities are having courses for bioinformatics i don't you have any program here bioinformatics Okay. So, yeah. In our program, no. In our program, no. Yeah, it will go. It's a matter of time. You will need that. And then bioinformatics is unavoidable alternative because it is like an elephant. So you can get different information from the elephant. You know, the the elephant when the four blind people go around, they will tell, oh, it's an elephant's leg. They can say it is a banana tree. You know or the ear they will say it is a fan so like that bioinformatics is like that because there is so much of data available unless you are trained to extract the data you will not be able to use the data so it will be it will remain as an elephant so you have to learn this so raw data is meaningless without context and the ultimate goal of bioinformatics is to extract knowledge from the large scale data and there are currently hundreds of software tools there are many softwares now available which is nowadays many people publish a lot of papers on meta-analysis. So you go into the NIH database, pick up 100 papers and then analyze that using your software and then they say that uh, whether how these programs were done and how this methodology was utilized and how it is wrong or right. And that is called meta-analysis. Lot of people, paper, lot of papers are published on that. And it is becoming very popular because you have access to the information. If you want to do some prostate cancer research, you will get access to thousands of papers. Then you pick up some of the important papers and then you write your meta-analysis. And that's how the uh, lot of people are working. So undertake sequencing, alignment, structure, function analysis is a large amount of biological data can be utilized. And more data is being collected than can be physically stored. And so nowadays, because of the cloud storage, you have enormous space to store the data. And that's how this data can be retrieved and cloud computing is changing the whole platform. You know, earlier what used to do was we were 4 GB, 2 GB, 1 TB, now cloud computing. So you are there, there is no limit for that. And that is where uh, the cloud platform is changing the healthcare data analysis. It is becoming a big thing in the system. And those who are ready to change, you have to change yourself. If you don't, you stuck to your computer only XT, it will never work because XT cannot extract the data. Another area which has changed in pharmacogenomics because in 2002, NIH completed the genomic data analysis and they studied millions of people to understand their genomic thing. So you will find that in pharmacogenomics, genomic information is used to study individual responses to drugs. So now this is your patient group. Suppose these are the number of patients. So you treat them with a medicine. Now when you treat them with a medicine, you will find that the green people, they show drug toxicity but beneficial. The yellow people, they show drug not toxic but not beneficial, of no use. They just take it and throw it away. But you are giving them because now there is no way to identify yellow people there. Then there are drug toxic but not beneficial are the red people. And then the white people are drug not toxic but beneficial. So your drug needs to be given to this group only. But today we are giving the drug to all the four groups. Now with the genomic studies, you are going to give drug to only this group. And this is what changing the whole healthcare now. Because you don't have to give the one medicine to all the patients and some patients have taxi effect, no benefit, only one group. And this is the best part. So in 10 years, you will find that every person will get different amount of drug. Now they found out in the genomic studies that African people, there, now this is another thing which I want to establish, is that there are two things where genetic polymorphism happen. So you have pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. So when you put the drug in the body, it will be absorbed, it will be distributed 
it will be metabolized and it will be excreted ADME they call it so absorption distribution metabolism and excretion is for every individual different it is not same to all the people now people are learning that and people have realized that African people absorption is different Asian people absorption is different Hispanic people absorption is different white Caucasian people absorption is different and their distribution their metabolism their excretion all different now they are understanding that just having clinical studies only in one group and then giving the drug to all the group is an injustice because you are making a mistake there and that is why the second stage is pharmacodynamics which is the drug will go to the receptor then it will go to the ion channels it will go to impact the enzymes it will impact the immune system that is called pharmacodynamics inside the body and this is also different for different people so nowadays in america fda is insisting that you cannot have clinical studies only with white caucasians you will have to have africans you will have to have hispanics you will have to have asians you will have to have white caucasian and you will have to have native american to get a clear picture of this genetic polymorphism at the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and this is where the things are going up and now this is the stage we will have it at pharmacogenomics and genetics from genetics you will go to the genomic medicine and from there you will move to the personalized medicine so in 5 to 10 years you will find that the world is moving towards personalized medicine and we will talk about that in one of the class, work, workshop lecture I have that on personalized medicine but this is how the things are changing and this is so important that in another 10 years nowadays I will tell you a very good example I have a very good friend who is director of pharmacogenomics in Thailand hospital he wrote chapters in my book so I was visiting him so I gave talks and all those things so we were interacting so he said that in the beginning when my pharmacogenomics setup was done in hospital no doctors were interested in knowing what it is then it so happened that one or two surgeons started coming to me asking what do you think about this surgery I am doing can you give me some data information so I did all the data information and then they found that that information was so useful for the surgeon so they started spreading the word that hey you should take the data from this guy and a day was there when he used to wait for samples to analyze now he has a long queue of samples because people realize the importance of genomics and it is very specialized uh, science so people are understanding that this is much useful if you do the genomic study before you treat the patient so that you don't have to give the same amount of drug and it is different you reduce the side effects and that is where this uh, pharmacogenomics is going to change the whole uh, healthcare and lead towards personalized medicine so every individual will be treated as individual person not as a part of the group and that's why that part of the group becomes a problem so there is another thing which is very important is leadership and leadership has no alternative whether you are in physics your chemistry or in biology or in any field unless you create leaders in your area so the purpose of the education should be to build up leadership in the students and let us learn to take the challenges of forthcoming changing scenario so we need to prepare our students so that they will be able to take leadership and they are able to manage the changing scenario if we don't teach them accepting the changing scenario then I am failing in my education teaching I am failure failed professor and that is what I think and that's why leadership has no alternative and innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower that Steve Jobs says the Apple guy and leadership is solving problem the day soldiers stop bringing you their problems is the day you have stopped leading them and they have either lost confidence that you can help or concluded you do not care either case is a failure of leadership that is what Colin Powell who used to be chief of the staff of army in America has said so leadership is solving problems so we have to educate our students not just giving the information but educate them to how to solve the problems how to approach to the solving the problems and that is where the graduate programs and masters program really help to understand how to tackle the problem how to give solution for the problem and that that builds up the leadership in the system so a great leader courage is to fulfill his vision comes from passion 
and not position. So uh, we have to create a passion in the minds of the student that they should be passionate about what they are doing, about studies. And that is the best part of, so no man is good enough to give another man without others' consent. That's Abraham Lincoln said. So I will be a good professor if I have more knowledge than the student, then the people will like me. If I have less knowledge, I don't put a lot of efforts in teaching, then automatically students will not like me. And that reflects on, I am uh, dean for faculty affairs, so I always get the evaluations of all the faculty. And I can understand who are putting a lot of efforts in teaching, who are not putting a lot of efforts in teaching. So I have to sit with the faculty, saying that your evaluation is not good. You better put efforts into teaching, otherwise you will be in trouble, you know. So this is our Taneja College of Pharmacy. So we offer PharmD program, residency and fellowships in many different areas of specialization, masters in pharmacy and nanotechnology, PhD in nanosciences, and welcome to the beautiful uh, Tampa. So we have different types of areas of research for the uh, things. Uh, now I have to talk to you two things very important, which I uh, do not want to put it on the one thing is uh, one major change is going to happen in the healthcare in coming 5 to 10 years is artificial intelligence. The world is going to change significantly. Nowadays you must be finding out that if I just google for a ticket from Tampa to Bogota, I still get, I am in Bogota, I still continuously get <laughs> information about a, if the price has gone down. That is artificial inclusion. And nowadays you find that you pick up, if you Google for some something, you want a small piece of some equipment. After five days, you start getting bombarded with emails. Oh, this is there, this is now the price. Of, yeah. Anything, even if you want to buy bread, you will get a lot of, oh, there are different breads available, Sardo is cheaper now. So this is all artificial intelligence. It is going to affect us whether you want it or not. Your life is no more private. The moment you start putting iPhone in your pocket, you lose your private life. The moment you put Alexa in your house, your private life is gone. Do you realize that? Because Alexa, I say, Alexa, what is the score of Dallas Cowboys football? Now Alexa gives me all the information and then it traps me that I am a cowboy fan. And then that cowboy fan information will be sent to the company. And then they start sending me buy the cowboy shirt, buy the cowboy, you know, all those things come out of that. So Alexa is in my home. My one question to Alexa, goes to the company, the company send me the information and I am pushed to buy the stuff. <laughs> so in due course of time, we are losing our privacy. There is no privacy for us. Everything, our life is open book because somebody else is monitoring us. And same thing is happening like TV. You know, in TV, you will find that children watch the TV. And then they want a particular serial only because actually they have never tested it. But because on TV they show the child eating the cereal and being happy, the child says, I want this only, I don't want anything. Does that make sense? So they are influencing your mind, the TV, the advertisements. And they influence you with artificial intelligence. Now you may get a TV program specially developed for you. You don't have to go to the channels. You just start the TV and they say, hey, welcome Professor Caesar. This is for you. <laughs> and that's how this artificial intelligence will be useful in healthcare also. So healthcare, they are expecting that in 10 years, you will have robo which will do the surgery. And the doctor will sit in front of the computer and just put up the program on the computer and then the patient will sleep on the bed, the robo from anesthesia will prick and the anesthesia will be given, there will be another robo which will prick on the leg to check whether the anesthesia is done or not. Then the third robo will come 
and cut your body, remove your heart, put in another heart, close your body, then anesthesia will be gone, the robot will inform the people of transportation, the body will, person will be taken to the ward. Everything will be done like Rome. In our case, in pharmaceutical industry, we used to say that the automation will go to such an extent that the owner of the company will take his dog early in the morning for a leash and then go to the company, put the button on, the company will work, product will be dispatched. No people in work. And that's how most automated. So, it is a very interesting thing that artificial intelligence is going to change our life. Every aspect of it. Every aspect of our life will be changed. They will be telling you what to do. And a day may come that the artificial intelligent computer will tell you, you stupid human being, listen to me. You don't know how to make the decision. You know, it is so mind-boggling that how they will help you to make the decision. You know, our iPhone, it can tell you that there are 10 products available, but I buy this one. So now you immediately go to that product. Mm -hmm. So you think, oh, this is what I have. So now you are not listening to other nine products. Or it may give you option of two. Between one and two, you take it. Now you don't worry about the rest of them. Now this is where the artificial intelligence, and in healthcare, it will happen so fast now, that in five to 10 years, you'll find that there will be enormous transformation in healthcare delivery, healthcare challenges, all these things. Even the role of doctor will be questionable, role of pharmacist will be questionable, role of nurses might be going down. And this is where the whole thing will move. And we don't know what is today. But like when I was a student in 1971, the computer I used was needing a huge big room. Now, it's in, okay. This is more stronger than that. And the same thing will happen in 15 years. That's why I say that you need to be ready for changes. It is going to happen. If you don't ready for changes, it will be a problem. But the second thing which I really want to point out to you is that in America, for our college, we are in all pharmacy colleges, medical colleges, are facing a challenge to get the students. Because Students are realizing that with, with the automation and with the online buying, most of the malls are becoming empty now. Nobody goes to the malls, big buildings, big shops, but they cannot sell anything. And it is becoming a big problem because malls are becoming bankrupt. Gradually you will find that in 10 years there will be not many malls. because Nobody wants to go to the malls. They want to buy everything online. Now Amazon is so good that you buy the product, if you don't like it, you return it back. You don't pay anything for shipping. You try. So you don't have to go to the dressing room to try the full pan, whether it fits or not. You order it, it comes to your home, you wear it, you don't like it, you send it back. Your money is given back. And this is where the pharmacy field now Many big pharmacies like Walgreens, CVS, they are closing stores because no customers. Earlier for one Walgreens to run the Walgreens regularly in seven days a week, they used to employ at least six to eight pharmacists earlier, well, three, four years back. Now they started cutting down the pharmacist jobs. So now they say, we don't want to put 24 by 7 Walgreen because nobody comes. You know, earlier it used to be passion. I get my medicine at 2 o'clock in the morning. Nowadays people get it online. They don't go. Why they will go 2 o'clock in the morning to get the medicine? And that's why this 24 by 7 concept is now dying. Nobody goes in the midnight. The safety also is a problem. So they don't want to go out. So they have realized that you don't need 24 by 7 shops. So automatically they are curtailing the job to the pharmacists. And that is affecting the recruitment for us. And uh, you will not be, you will be surprised 
but I have a friend who is a professor in California. Their recruitment till 2020 was 120 students. This year they could not get even 30 students. From 120 to 30. For our university from 100 we came down to 54. So this is a challenge which is big challenge for pharmacy profession. And I did not put it on the slides because it is difficult to put it on the slides. Mm -hmm. But this is the challenge. So artificial intelligence and this is going to be changing whether there will be a death of pharmacy or we will have to come up with some new avenues to build up the things. So that's it. Muchas gracias. Yes, yes, yeah, was it good? It was Very giving nice. a different thing. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it is applicable to physics also. It is applicable to good number of sciences now that whether they will survive this onslaught of the technology or they will have to come up with new things. And that uh, is the challenge they have. Some questions. Yes. <laughs> so let me show you the questions. In oh, the we chart. have a lot of questions there. I am happy yeah, to answer them. Firstly, let me change. Okay. Four. No. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Let me have a picture of you and me on the screen. <laughs> okay. So let me open the microphones for your questions. Can you just broaden it and I take the picture yeah. of this one? <laughs> you come closer to the thing. So. Okay. Well, I'm opening the. Okay. So now you can open your microphones while we can read some of the questions already in the chat. So, uh, yes, uh, current Alarcon says it is very sad to lose more contact with people every day. I believe that. Uh, Nanotechnologies should be used as soon, but personal contact with a treating doctor or therapist should be not lost. Oh. How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the world is changing. Even though I agree with you fully, but I am 70 years old and I like that. I will support what you have stated. KR, correct? Got so, it. Got it. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it is a great uh, thought what you have projected and I think it is a challenge for the humanity and probably humanity should not go in this direction, that is my personal opinion. But I cannot change the speed with which the technology is overtaking our lives. Technology as I mentioned overtaking our privacy, technology is overtaking our minds, technology is not allowing us to think independently. We don't think independently. If we are now we are in an election um, time for America and the bombarding of the information is so much that I stop thinking. And that is what happens with every common man and this is where uh, is a challenge for humanity and it may lead to the destruction of humanity or it may lead to the betterment of the humanity. But uh, the people are worried about application of artificial intelligence in our day-to-day -day life. And for that matter, I would like to tell you that I don't buy the book, but I have edited a book which is called Ethical Issues Related to Artificial Intelligence. And there are ethical issues which are very serious. I will give you a very simple example. We gave our DNA samples without blinking our eyes to the companies. We don't know where our samples are. We don't know how they are going to use it. But if they want to use it for good purpose, they can use it for good purpose. If they want to use it for bad purpose, they can use it for bad purpose because they can create mRNA viruses based mm -hmm. on our DNA samples, exclusively killing Hispanic population, exclusively killing Indian population, or white Caucasian or African. This is a danger mm -hmm. because with artificial intelligence uh, you have billions of samples of DNA. You know at least 
50 percent of the world's population gave their swab. 50 percent. When did they gave took the swab for COVID? They took your DNA, and this is what is a big challenge. And artificial intelligence can analyze that whole billions of samples, put it into different groups, and then provide the tools for the scientists to prepare mRNA viruses, which can be focused on specific population of the world. And these type of ethical challenges are there. I don't know, but the new generation will have to be understanding, will have to be strong enough to say that no, no, and we don't want to out of this. And this is where the tug of war will happen and we'll see who will be the victim of this ethical issue. Does that answer your question? Let's see. She got it. Oh, she won't. Please tell me about your risk management course. Oh, yes. I, I, I have a um, course for masters. Uh, if you are interested in taking that course you online, you can register with our university and you can take the course online. Our graduate program offers a master's program in nanotechnology which is online. And you can sit in Colombia at your place and take the courses at your pace and complete the master's MS in pharmaceutical nanotechnology using online program and you get a certificate from University of South Florida for your uh, masters. My course is risk management uh, involved in nanotechnology and it covers, uh, I have 14 classes I give them, I have two exams I offer them and then they have to write, I always insist on writing skills. So I expect that my master student should write a publishable and I try to publish that as a paper. So that helps that student to get a job as well as it adds to his resume. So also I provide them five articles of different backgrounds. I ask them to write a note on transferring the knowledge of that research paper to the nanotechnology manufacturing. How the risk can be mitigated, how the risk can be re reduced. And the whole program starts with how nanoparticles are small, what kind of risks are involved, what kind of precautions you can take to uh, avoid the risk and what type of management principles can be adopted to reduce the risk in the nanotechnology uh, sector. And that is what my course is. I hope this gives you enough information. You can go on our website, go to the Taneja College of Pharmacy and slash graduate programs and you will find the program. It is a very good program and you save a lot of money because you can finish your master's in pharmaceutical nanotechnology sitting in Colombia. So you don't have to fly, you don't have to rent an apartment there and there is a fee for that obviously. It will be there but you know still it is a lot of saving and most of the courses are online. You can complete that and they have four different uh, approaches. One is called master in Pharmaceutical nanotechnology with entrepreneurship. So that program expects you to work in a startup company. So we provide an opportunity to work for six months in um, startup company. Second thing is um, nanotechnology manufacturing. So you have opportunity to work. Third is research. Six months you do the research and publish the paper and your master's is completed. And fourth is understanding nanoparticular drug delivery system which itself is a big area uh, that uh, they have added courses to educate you in the nanoparticular degree system. So that way it covers four different aspects of master's program and four specializations. Any other, did, did that answer your question? They will go in the... Any questions? Uh, do you think the, the people trust uh, very high in the algorithm and the bioinformatics uh, AI? Because uh, the people 
uh, today is uh, uh, half relevant uh, in the technology, the algorithm. Do you think the algorithm uh, dangers, uh, for example, for instance, in 2030, yeah. people trust uh, the, <laughs> in the algorithm and it does, that is the reason the uh, students is not enrolled in the university? You know, the, what is happening is now, whether you want it or not, but the education is going in that direction. They will be using an algorithm for all this science. So obviously, in due course of time, people will have to be taught how to use AI. So today, we are teaching some basic things. But gradually, you will have to change your curriculum. Because if you don't change the curriculum, then you are creating people who are useless to the society. Because society is moving in a highly technological environment. And that is where uh, I was telling that uh, our university, my college, we provide courses on bioinformatics to pharmacists. We provide courses on geriatric pharmacy. We provide courses on pharmacogenomics. Because that is the key, how the move, changes are moving in that direction. And probably after 10 years, we may have to change also another direction. Because science will be changing. So we are, normally every five years, we revisit the curriculum and change, make a lot of changes. So last year only, we changed a lot of curriculum and incorporated many of these things in the curriculum because we are seeing that after 10 years, our students will be outdated if we continue the same curriculum. And that is why most of the good universities in the United States have a change in curriculum pattern. So every five years, all the faculty sit together, they revisit it, they invite people from outside, invite people from industry, invite people from the practice, and try to find out where the profession is moving. Then adopt the changes in the curriculum. Once you adopt the changes in the curriculum, automatically your students will be eligible to work longer time. And they will also have lifelong learning attitude. Because if you say that, oh, because now what happens is most of the time students bring the notes from the previous class. But if you change the curriculum, it doesn't work. So five years, your notes, suppose you are a good student. Normally in all the universities it happens, good student notes are circulated. And all the students use them because they are good. But those notes will be outdated in five years. If you stick to those notes, you will fail. That is how the curriculum change is one of the key to build up good student body to make sure that they work 50 years. And the target, when, whenever I, in orientation, I always go and talk to the students. So I, I tell them that I am the good example in front of you, 50 years working and I am still active. And I published books in artificial intelligence. I am not working on tablets or my PAD was microcalculation. I don't I didn't stick there. If you stick to microcalculation, I would I would have been outdated long back. So you need to change as the things change. In NIH grants also, the focus of the grants given changes every five, six years. So if you don't change, you will not get grants. That is where you have to be ready for changes. And the science generations are becoming smaller and smaller. So if you do not change, you retire early. This is a good equipment with the evolution. Yeah. Okay. If you do not adapt to the environment, you want And the technology is changing. You know, scanning electron microscope, I said, now it comes on tables. And tabletop scanning SEM. Now you have to adapt to it because you have to learn how it works. So your learning brain, the more you learn, the brain cells activated. That's why you should be thinking. I say that because uh, uh, I found a developer with, uh, with Python language and uh, sometimes I create 
a fail from the squares program. The students uh, trusted uh, that the program is real, is effective, and the answer is wrong. Then uh, the student don't think uh, in the knowledge, uh, but also a team in the algorithm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, and if you think uh, in the next years, yes. uh, that uh, that concept is very crazy, increasing in uh, with the pay. I don't think that the algorithm is fake, but in the health system, if the algorithm fails, is uh, they will change. They will have to change it. So it is. It is always you know, all this technology is human based. So there is always a possibility of human error in every technology, and that's why they improve continuously. So, I don't know, do you have any friend who are in software? So, software engineers are 24 by 7 working because if they create a software, once it is implemented, it fails. Then they update it, they update it, you know. That's how it works. So, what you need is a good training. Second thing is, ready to understand the challenges within the system. And that is only possible when you have good mentors. So shall I draw a picture? If you allow me five minutes, yeah. two minutes. I will I always discuss this with my students. And you will love it to I will need one of the markers. Oh, okay. Sorry. You will love my I hope so. If I teach all my students this particular graph every time when they come to my office. And this graph is very simple. Yeah. Okay, this graph is very simple. You are here and you want to go there. Now I will give you five minutes to interpret this graph. In the meantime, I will go to the instrument. <laughs> I need to go. One second, I need to go. Bueno, abrimos los micrófonos para que los demás, los que están en línea también participen del desafío que nos dejó el profesor Pataj de interpretar esa gráfica. A ver quién quiere, simplemente abran sus micrófonos y... Haga mi intervención eh, voluntariamente. Eh, si ¿sí están viendo el tablero, están en la imagen de... En la, en la cámara de auxiliar, que está con mi cuenta, con mi nombre. Ok. No sé, yo, yo, yo no estoy hablando de la teoría, sino que estoy la otra con, con la función de trabajo. Y con la función de trabajo que uno dice, bueno, pues va independiente. No, claro que el trabajo no es una función de Estado, pero. Los campos conservativos. ¿sí? Porque lo otro me parece una onda. Sí, pero miren que los tres parten de acá. Y estos dos llegan al mismo punto. Y sí, que... es como si fuera... Una me parece una función de estado que independientemente del camino que lleve, va a cualquiera que el camino que lleve. Pero la, la, me, me corcha la, la parte en duro. Sí. Y eso a propósito de, 
que la pregunta tuya sobre, sobre los efectos que tenga pues, los errores en, la, en los algoritmos y en la interpretación de la información que nos puede dar. Sí, es que yo hice una vez un programa, pero pequeño, solamente por molestar, y les dije, venga, porque tocaba hacer la, la típica ecuación de segundo orden para sacar las dos respuestas y todo, y uno sabe que, pues, lógicamente el programador modifica su algoritmo. Y al modificar su algoritmo, entonces lo que puso fue yo y los, las, los estudiantes faltaron las respuestas y pensaron que eso era correcto, ni siquiera lo de una. Sí. Entonces, eh, eh, y eso, pues, lógicamente da a entender, y eso no solamente pasa en los estudiantes, sino pasa en la población. Confía mucho en el algoritmo y dice: este, si le llegan muchos pacientes con los mismos síntomas, aunque busquemos la población blanca, que es la que el, el medicamento no tiene efecto y que va a ser beneficioso, no. No es fácil. Ah, we have a How do you interpret that? I associate with two states. Uh, like uh, function state. Doesn't share the trajectory, uh, the final state and the initial state is the same. But uh, I have problem with the ondulatory <laughs> cord. So what do you think? He doesn't think. <laughs> no, okay. He's thinking, but the problem is that he doesn't speak English. No, you but you can say, say in, in Spanish. Spanish. In Spanish, he will translate for me. Y en qué dinámica, que pues, no importaba el, el, el por donde fuera el partido, pero era no, pero sí está como rara esa función de una por este lado. No llega ni. Basically, he says uh, that he's agreed with the, he agrees with Professor Oscar, so that uh, the, 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 the same point uh, regarding uh, this kind of uh, conversation, uh, conservation fields, when It doesn't matter the path, but uh, if you get the same final point, the work or the change in the state is exactly the same, uh, uh, no matter the, okay. the path. And Let me explain you. He is also confused with the waveform uh, curve. That you have. Let me explain you. It will be very easy to understand now. Uh, sorry, but uh, Karen has told something else. Uh, the same, uh, but I said that the, in the scale of time, there are oscillations, but everything allows the growth uh, of the information, uh, who, which is uh, feeding from the system, something like that. <laughs> Let me explain it, very simple. What I told you was that you are here. You want to go here, correct? This is the shortest path. Make sense? Yeah. This is a little bit longer. This you never reach. <laughs> Correct? Now try to understand. You ignored most important thing. How many arrows are here? Yes. Ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 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 How many arrows are here? Eight. Three. Three. How many arrows are here? Six. Six. Zero. Each arrow represents a mentor. The more mentors you get, you reach your destination shortest way. If you don't get good mentors, you take more time, less mentors. If you do not get any mentors, you never reach there. Make sense? Makes sense. Some more mentors you get, more good professors like Professor Caesar. <laughs> if you get it, you will reach here. But if you don't get it, you will not. And now I have to ask you a question. Who is the first mentor? Mother. The mother. Correct. <laughs> Absolutely correct. Because if the mother doesn't breastfeed you, you are dead in three hours. A lot of people say parents, but father doesn't do anything. <laughs> It is the mother. Madre, madre is the first. And that is most important. Now you look back. 
when you were in high school you had 100 students suppose mm -hmm. these 100 students some went this way some went this way and some went this way correct because not all 100 students came to university some of them went this way because they didn't get good mentors they may not have good mothers or they may not have problems opportunities so personally i believe that every person is capable of reaching here but the challenge is with mentors if you get good mentors everybody will go there if you don't get good mentor you will take longer route or you will not go there so the person who is homeless is not useless but he did not get the mentors if you would have got good mentors you would have had his car but unfortunately even though abilities are there but god was planning different way and that's why never underestimate anybody <laughs> gracias gracias is it good yeah yeah nice i always Very tell nice. all my students when they come this is the best nice. time i can yeah Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Gracias, everyone. And then, more questions, or can we say thanks and goodbye? Have the people online whether they like this or not. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they are seeing the picture. And that's it. Okay, it seems there are no more questions. So, thank you very much, Professor. Gracias. Everyone. So, I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, muchas gracias a ustedes. Nos vemos mañana. Thank you very much. So nice.